Starting on page 489, Schillinger discusses the question of planning modulatory progressions and offers a series of techniques which are fascinating because they're based on rhythmic resources and principles first described at the very start of the Schillinger system. The appearance of rhythmic principles in a portion of the text dealing with harmony is evidence of Schillinger's consistency of the approach and the efficacy of his methods in the realm of harmony is demonstrated by the simplicity of the techniques and the potency of the musical effect. A modulation problem could be viewed as measuring the interval between the starting and ending points, that is, the distance between two keys. If this distance was described as a number, then it would be possible to bridge the pitch range by subdivision. Each member of the subgroup would be an interval between two root tones. So, for instance, if the aim was to modulate from C up to G, the range expressed in semitone units would be 7. And any pattern derived from this starting point would offer a potential root progression. Harmonization of these roots could then proceed in any desirable manner. Obviously, care must be taken when planning such progressions. For example, the direction of travel up or down is important, and an inconsistent approach will lead to errors. The choice of intervals, numbers that is, determines the flavour, as it were, of the progression. A small starting range, for instance a modulation from the key of C to the key of D, can be extended by inverting the interval in this case a major second, through an octave. That would make a much bigger interval, a minor tenth, of ten semitones. Another solution to the problem is to add twelve, or multiples of twelve, to any number, and thereby hugely extend the range. In the following example, I have started with the interval of a perfect fourth, that's five semitones, and I've added the octave, twelve, to make a range of 17. The modulation begins on C and ends on F, but in between passes through roots generated by the number pattern 5552, which of course adds up to 17. I've tried to preserve the interval of the fourth as much as possible, hence the use of the number 5. A slightly different sequence results if one descends through 5552. Five, five, First, let's hear a simple symmetric harmonization of the ascending progression. And now the descending progression. You'll notice that the original root progressions have been altered by use of octave transposition. It's this and the voice leading of the chord structures that accounts for the fact that both progressions appear to rise. Finally, here's an example of exactly the same root progression, harmonized somewhat differently and arranged for a small band. On page 524, Schillinger introduces a discussion entitled Indirect Modulation. In his typically provocative style, he criticises so-called academic modulation techniques, 
he doesn't name any names, which he says attempt to give directions as to the planning of long-range modulations. To briefly summarise his findings, Schillinger concludes that any modulations to keys that are adjacent to one another on the cycle of fifths produces dull results, and that almost any other progression is preferable. The more radical the leaps, the better. The only principle of the academic method that he endorses is the alternation of major and minor keys. Look at figure 247 on page 525. Here you'll see the cycle of fifths arranged on a vertical axis. In the centre of the axis is C, with sharp keys rising above it and flat keys below. A series of modulations can be planned by drawing a graph against this axis, ensuring that any small step-wide movements in the vertical direction are compensated for by wide leaps at other times. This technique is very reminiscent of the graphs associated with melodic construction that we explored in semester A, week 6 to 10. Schillinger's assertion that the avoidance of stepwise progressions through the cycle of fifths will produce credible modulatory journeys may seem far-fetched, but I invite you to put it to the test. What follows is an example of my own experiment. First, I pretty much randomly chose the starting and ending keys from the available 24 major and minor scales. My choice was to start with D minor and end with A flat major. This seemed appropriate since the two keys are fairly distant from one another, their tonics being a tritone apart. I decided to follow a trajectory which, if graphed, would look like an expanding spiral. The first movement, away from D minor, was to the immediate relative F major. From there, by a slightly larger leap, to E flat minor, Next, I introduced a radical leap from E flat minor up the axis to E major and finished with the widest jump of all to my final key, A flat minor. On page 528, Schillinger discusses the duration of each modulation and concludes that the whole journey should have some kind of pre planned rhythmic distribution. I decided to assign four bars to my starting key, D minor, and to squeeze the remaining modulations into the next four bars. The journey would therefore occupy eight bars in all, a useful kind of duration, I thought. The final key would appear in bar nine and could continue for four bars, bars nine to twelve, before more modulation occurred. Since the starting and ending keys are a tritone apart, the same pattern of modulations beginning on A flat minor leads back to D minor by bar 17, and the entire progression forms an endless loop. Here is the first eight bars slowed down. Following this, you'll hear the progression up to speed. <laughs> 